Okay, so our mathematician spotlight tonight today is Autumn Kent. She is an associate professor at Wisconsin. Now you know what associate professor means. It means she has tenure. Good. Um, so she studies geometry, topology, dynamical systems, and knot theory. So I thought that today I'd tell you what knot theory is. So in math, um, knot theory is you take a string and you do something with it. So maybe you make a knot, like a, a climbing knot, like a figure eight knot, whatever. You do something with it, whatever you want, and then you take the ends and you glue them together. So in knot theory, um, a knot is a closed loop that maybe has some, some knots in it. And the big question in knot theory is, suppose I take my, my rope and I make a knot over here, and you take your rope and you make a knot over there, and then we compare. How do you tell if they're the same? Um, or, or if I draw my knot out so you can see where all the strings go and where all the crossings are, which one crosses over which, I do that with one knot or in another knot, can you tell if they're the same? So for instance, um, how about like these two knots? They look kind of different, yes? But maybe they're different and maybe they're not. It's hard to know. So perhaps we'll pass them around and you can decide if you think that they're the same or different. Um, even with, uh, well, even it's sometimes hard to tell whether something is the unknot or not. Have you ever had it happen that you're like trying to get your headphones unknotted and you're like, is this even possible? Right? So it's an interesting question if you have a presentation of something to even say whether it's the unknot, which is like the circle, or not. So that's what knot theory tries to do. And amazingly, this question is really hard. So it would be nice if you were given like a drawing of a knot where it had all the nice curves and all the crossings. You could like come up with a number or something, something that uniquely defined that knot. So that if you saw another picture, and it happened to be actually the same knot secretly, but somebody had just moved all the pieces around, that when you computed this number, you'd come out the same. You could be like, I know, they're the same. Kind of like a fingerprint or a, like a DNA or whatever. For, for the knot. But nobody has been able to come up with one yet. There are some really good ones that usually distinguish between two knots, but they all like break down on some knot. So like they're good at distinguishing everything, except actually they come up with the num same number for these two. And these two are different knots. So people are working on that. And it's related to other things like hyperbolic geometry. So, so Autumn is working on that. Or more abstract versions of knot theory that are beyond the scope of this piece of string. So feel free to make some knots. Make a knot. There, make a knot. Good, good. Make an unknot. Good. So that's knot theory. Yeah, and it's a great uh, area for undergraduate research as well. So, so like Colin Adams over at Williams College has undergraduate students working on knot theory and doing cut, groundbreaking things every summer. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, you could do it. Yeah. Have you guys thought about knots? Questions or ideas? No. Okay. Great. Okay. So, um, last time we talked about double integrals for the first time. And we uh, talked about what they mean. It's like for computing volumes under surfaces for double integrals. And we also d talked about Fubini's theorem. Anybody remember what Fubini's theorem was about? Uh, that was the fold in one cut theorem, was the, was the five pointed star. But that was a good theorem, right? Two theorems last time, I guess. Yeah. It's the one where you can flip around the two integrals, right? Yeah, you can flip around the two integrals. So. Um, uh, if your function is nice and you're integrating over a rectangle, yeah, you can uh, switch the order of integration. So that's Fubini's theorem. Fold and one cut theorem, also a good theorem. Um, question. Yeah. Did you say that Houdini used to do the <laughs> Houdini, the mathematician, the, the, not the mathematician, the magician Houdini <laughs> used to do the, f the, the fold and one cut theorem trick where you cut out a star with a single cut. Pretty good, right? Yep. Were you able to do it again later? Did you try? No? Did anyone try again later? You should try again later so that you remember. It's easy to forget things, but it's a good trick. Okay. Okay. So today we'll do more examples of, um, a couple more examples of double integrals, and then we will put it on a firm foundation by defining it 
using Riemann sums, and I have brought some toys for this. So that's what's happening. Okay, so, so as a first example, um, justify geometrically why why this integral, the double integral of y dA over the region where zero goes from uh, x goes from zero to one hundred and y goes from negative 1 to 1, why this integral is 0. That's it. It's just 0. So in all things in life, but in especially in math, and especially maybe in double integrals, you should always draw a picture. So maybe a good picture, in this case, you could draw a picture in the xy plane, or the yz plane, or the xz plane. But I'm going to suggest the yz plane. So this y, this is like f of x, y equals y. That's your function that's defining your surface. And it, we usually think of z as being f of x, y. So this is like z equals y. So let's draw this in the z, y plane. So if we have y here and z here, our y is going from negative 1 to 1. And our z. Well, our function is z equals y. So z equals y, that's kind of like the function y equals x in standard coordinates. So it just looks like this. Here's z equals y. And so we want to know what is the area under this function. So over here, we're cutting it off at negative 1. And over here, we're cutting it off at 1. So it's this, this area. And then we say also, x is going from 0 to 100. So you can imagine if this is the yz plane, where x equals 0, then the x-axis is coming out all the way from 0 to 100. So we're trying to find the volume of this thing, where this thing is a volume, this bit and this bit, with a height of 100. Can you kind of see it? So if we try to draw it in perspective over here, um, here's the xy plane. So here, um, here x is going from like 0 to 1, but really you can imagine it coming out further. y is going from negative 1 to 1. Uh, and then we're going down to the plane z equals y. So there's, we're going approximately to there, and we're going up to z equals y, which is positive over here. And then the plane is connecting this. So it's something like this part. Yeah, there. There it is. OK, so we're trying to find the volume inside this solid, where it actually it's much longer in this direction. Could you figure out why that volume should come out to zero? Yeah? Zane, you have an idea? It's going to be negative on the left. So here's a negative volume. And positive on the right. So here's a positive volume. OK, I have a negative volume and a positive volume. Yeah, and they're going to be equal because the, shape, the shapes are congruent. Yeah, if we take this shape and we just turn it 180 degrees, we would get this shape. So um, this, is, this has an equal negative and positive volumes. So the total volume is 0. Yeah, nice. And we could have seen that back over here because we had equal and opposite areas. So the total area over here is 0, and then you multiply by a height of 100. Still get a volume of 0. Yeah. Um, th the way to talk about this mathematically is that y is an odd function with respect to y. An odd function means that it's something, so here's, here's the function y. If an odd function is something where if you turn the picture 180 degrees around the origin, you get the same thing. 
clearly that is the case for this, because it's just a line. Um, and if you integrate an odd function over a symmetric interval, you get zero. So this function is symmetric for, for y, it's from negative one to one, so we're going to get zero. So even if my function had been something different, as long as it still was an odd function, the area over a symmetric region would be zero. And similarly for the volume. So it's a nice trick that makes things go away. It's the same thing that made the function that we did last time at the end of class come out to zero. Yeah, yeah, questions or ideas? So let's do another example. Okay, the purpose of the next example, there's three parts. So one is to just do another double integral so you get a little practice seeing how it goes before you have to do it yourself. The second is to remind you that integration by parts is a thing, it's a useful thing, and to remind you what it is and how it works. And the third thing is to uh, also remind you that sometimes double integrals are easier in one order of integration than the other. So if you get stuck in one order, try the other. Okay, so let's do it. So our example is uh, find the volume under the function z equals x times e to the xy over the rectangle where x goes between 1 and 2 and y goes between 1 and 3 in the xy plane. Okay, this is our request. It looks like something. I'm not sure exactly, but we want to find this. So we could do either order of integration. Let's start with y on the inside and x on the outside. So if we have x on the outside, then we're going from x equals 1 to x equals 2, from y equals 1 to y equals 3 of x, e to the xy, and then dy, because that's on the inside, and then dx on the outside. And because double integrals can be a little bit scary, you can put blinders on so that you're only looking at the inside first. So the first thing to do is start on the inside, kind of like the opposite of a Russian nesting doll. We start on the inside, so we'll do this first. Okay, so let's do it. So we copy the outside x integral. We're going from x equals 1 to x equals 2. Eventually we'll do that. But before that, we should do the inside. So can anybody find the, the antiderivative of x e to the xy with respect to y? x squared e to the xy? That is the derivative. Uh, yep, but close, right? Close? Yeah, idea. Yeah, it's just e to the xy, so it's, it's, it's okay, it's okay, you just went the wrong way, it's all right. Um, so it's just x, no, it's just, as Nathan said, e to the xy. And so we can check by taking the derivative. So if we take the derivative of this with respect to y, e to the something is just e to the something, and then multiply by the derivative of the outside, inside, so we would get an extra x on the outside. Yeah, nice. Okay, so it works. So let's plug in from y equals 1 to y equals 3. And we'll take that integral eventually, dx. Okay, so I'll copy the outside. We're going from x equals 1, x equals 2, um, of whatever's inside. Okay, so we just have to plug in y equals 3 here. So if you plug in y equals 3 to e to the xy, you get e to the 3x. So e to the 3x minus, if you plug in y equals 1 here, you get e to the x. So equal, minus e to the x. And then we're going to integrate that dx. OK. And now we're down to a single variable integral. So we just have to integrate this. So the integral of e to the 3x with respect to x, same kind of deal. You divide by the um, coefficient of the x. So it'll be like 1 third e to the 3x. Um, if you're not sure, you can use substitution. Or you can check by taking the derivative. So if we took the derivative of this, it would be 1 third times e to the 3x times the derivative of the inside, which is 3. So the 1 third and the 3 would cancel out, and we get what we started with, e to the 3x. Okay, minus e to the x. It's its own derivative it own, and its own integral. So let's evaluate that whole thing from x equals 1 to x equals 2. So let's see, when we plug in x equals 2, 
we get one third e to the sixth minus e squared. Okay, that's what I got when I plugged in x equals two, that whole thing, minus whatever I get when I plug in x equals one. So minus one third e cubed minus e. And then you could multiply, like distribute the negative sign to eliminate the parentheses if you wanted to. But there, something. Okay, so it's just some number. Probably a positive number. Looks like a positive number. Yeah. Great. No? Yes. Yes. Definitely positive because, let's see, actually, e to the something is always positive, and on our region, x is always positive. So the integrand is always positive, so the number should come out positive. Yeah. Okay. Question? Idea? Okay. Okay, let's try it in the other order of integration. Just to see how it, how it goes. Dramatic foreshadowing, it won't go nearly as well, but we'll have to see how it goes. So let's put x on the inside now and y on the outside. So if we have y on the outside, y is going from one to three, x is going from one to two, and we're integrating x, e to the xy, dx, dy. And we'll just start by focusing on the inner integral and trying to do that. So if, let's see, we want to find the antiderivative of x e to the xy with respect to x. Life is hard. There's no obvious antiderivative of that. So one of the techniques we have to deal with that is integration by parts. So, integration by parts to the rescue. It might work, it doesn't always work, but it might work. So integration by parts. Um, you just, you get it by using the product rule and taking the derivative of both sides. That's where it comes from. So it shouldn't be like a magic trick, it's just integrating the product rule. Um, it says that if you want to take the integral of some function u times dv, it's just u times v minus the integral of v times du. So you can see if you move this over to the other side, you get what u dv plus v du. That's like a product rule type thing, f prime g minus plus f g prime. Okay, so the trick of integration by parts is to to figure out which part should be your u and which part should be your dv. And it's not obvious. You might have to try a few things before you find something where you can integrate v du. So let's try it. So um, we have to find something to be our u and we have to find something to be our dv. So maybe something to try is that this guy should be u and this guy should be dv. So this turns out to be a good choice, um, but you could have tried u as e to the xy and dv as x times dx. It also might have worked. Maybe not. So let's try this. So u here, we've decided it should be x, and dv is e to the xy dx. Okay, so once you've decided that, you have to figure out what is du and what is v? So here you have to take a derivative, and here you have to find an antiderivative. So if u is x, then du is just dx. Okay? And if dv is e to the xy dx, we have to find the function that we differentiated to get that. So I guess if, if our variable is x, it should be uh, 1 over y e to the xy. Does it work? It's okay? Okay. So here's our like scratch work for integration by parts, uh, where we picked u and dv, and then we figured out du and v from that. So this tells us, integration by parts tells us that the integral of u dv, that's the thing we have up here, is u times v, so x times 1 over y e to the xy, minus the integral of v, which is 1 over y 
e to the xy times du. So here is our u, here is our v, here is our v, and here is our du. Sorry, this should be dx. My bad. Sorry. Okay. And that's all good. Um, when we wanted to integrate this from x equals 1 to x equals 2. So let's evaluate this whole thing from x equals 1 to x equals 2. So let's first uh, write out what we get. So this is x times 1 over y e to the xy minus, okay, now the, the key of integration by parts is to find something where you can actually do this integral. So can we indeed find the antiderivative of 1 over y e to the xy? Yes. What is it? Are you willing to come back and try again? Um, it would just be 1 over y squared. Yeah. Right? Yeah, right. 1 over y squared e to the xy. Nice. Yeah, because if we were to take the derivative with respect to x, we'd multiply by a y, and that would get us back to 1 over y. Nice. Okay, and now we want to evaluate this from this whole thing. Evaluate it from x equals 1 to x equals 2. So let's do it. So if we go here with x equals 2, here we get 2 over y e to the 2y minus 1 over y squared e to the 2y. I guess I could have combined like terms. Uh, minus um, 1 over y e to the y minus 1 over y squared e to the y. Okay, so we've done it. So this integrand that looked so hard, we were able to actually compute it. So we can put that in, triumphantly conclude that now this is the integral from y equals 1 to y equals 3 of this whole thing. So 2 over y e to the 2y minus 1 over y squared e to the 2y uh, minus 1 over y e to the y plus, because it's minus minus, 1 over y squared e to the y, dy. Yay! Well, like temporarily yay. <sighs> because some of these, yeah, now we're, now we're, we've dug ourselves like deeper into a hole. We were like, I know. What, like, I'll fix global warming by like shooting stuff into the atmosphere. That's sure to make the problem better. That's kind of what we did here. We're like, I know, I'll integrate by parts. This will be so much better than what we started with. Mm. No. So, but we didn't know, right? You had to try. We had to try. And so now we're stuck. So, so this order uh, gives us an impossible integral. Sad face, um, so other order was better. Yeah, so yeah, question. Um, that's a good question. Is it just the one over y squared terms that don't work? I'm not sure, I did not try to do them. Um, it's possible that you could do some of them with integration by parts, but I think for sure the one over y squared terms you could not do. Yeah. Yeah, same idea, yeah, yeah. You can always try, but yeah, good, yeah, okay. <coughs> okay, yeah, other questions or ideas? Okay, okay. Are there ever gonna be any integrals that we actually have to integrate by parts because the other way is impossible, or? Is it mostly just going to be the harder side? We'd have to integrate by parts, but the easier side would be uh, the order of integration. Um, I, I might ask you to do integrals where you have to use integration by parts. Yeah. Yeah, it might come to you because the other integration is too hard, so now you have to do integration by parts, or it might just be that, yeah, integration by parts is the right way to go. It's a good, it's a good method, so it's good to remind yourself every so often 
that it exists and kind of keep yourself fresh in uh, picking which one is you and which one is DV and just making it happen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So, so the next thing to do, perhaps, is to put double integrals on a firm foundation, like define what they're really about. So, to first, the thing we'll do is uh, review um, single variable Riemann sums. So, so back in single variable calculus, you had a function. Here it is, a function of just one variable, f of x. And you wanted to know, if you are going to integrate between a and b, I want to know what is the area under this curve from a to b. I want to know it. But what, do, like, what does it even mean, the area under a curve? Like, it's curvy. How could you possibly even define what it would mean to find this area? It would be hard. So the way you do it is you define it as a limit of areas of things that I understand, which is rectangles. So you pick, at the beginning, you pick your favorite number. My favorite number is 5. And you break this into that many rectangles. So there's five rectangles. So the first thing to do is break your interval that you're integrating over into n rectangles. And then in each, um, in each sub interval, the sub interval, sorry, n intervals, I meant, I was, that's dramatic foreshadowing that they're going to become rectangles. So break it into n sub intervals and choose um, uh, an like, example value of x in each one. So they don't all have to be at the same place. Sometimes you choose, I'm going to pick the left side of every interval. Sometimes you choose, I'm going to pick the right side of every interval. But it doesn't really matter. You can pick them however you like. Then for each of these, you compute f of that. So this is x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. And then we compute f of each one. So I'll stand in front of it for just a minute so that I try to get these things to be vertical. Okay, so now we compute f of, so here's, for example, f of xi, x1, and then we make a rectangle of that height. So there's that one. So make a rectangle of height f of x1, a rectangle of height f of x2, a rectangle of height f of x3, a rectangle of height f of x4, and a rectangle of height f of x5. There. OK? And now we just find the area of all these rectangles and add them up. There. OK? So we define uh, the area under f of x on AB. That is the integral from a to b of f of x dx. And what we do to find it is we add up um, f of xi uh, times the little width of our interval. So we call the, the width of each interval change in x. So, and that's written delta x. So each of these little distances is delta x. Delta x, little change in x. And so this is the area of each box because delta x is the width and f of xi is the height. So we take this sum from i equals 1 to n. Here n is 5. And then in order to find the actual area under the curve, we take the limit as n goes to infinity of that thing. So that means that the boxes get narrower and narrower and narrower until they approximate the value, the area under the curve, exactly. So, so that's how they go. That's how it goes for single variable calculus. We define our integrals as a limit of Riemann sums. Ready for two variables? Here we go. OK. So for multivariables, actually, I'll just write that we're going to talk about them, and then I won't draw them on the board. So for multivariable Riemann sums, instead of drawing pictures, which is kind of hard, 
I have made these lovely little things. So suppose you want to integrate a function. So it's supposed to be a smooth surface. Can you see what the smooth surface would look like if I had done the smooth surface? So suppose we want to find the volume under this smooth surface. It's called the monkey saddle. It's called the monkey saddle because you imagine there's a monkey sitting here, and the two legs go here, and the tail goes off the back. Yeah? OK. So you want to find the volume of that over this particular square. So what you do is you break the region into rectangles. In this case, the ones that I've printed out, uh, we broke it into squares. But it doesn't have to be squares. They could be like two by one rectangles or whatever. They could be, they don't all have to be the same size either. OK. Then within each little square, you pick a representative point and you find the value of the function as that point. And then you make the rectangular box whose area is your rectangle and whose height is f of your example point. So if you have a sort of a coarse selection of rectangles, big rectangles, you get something like this. Yeah? And if we make the rectangles smaller, you get a better approximation. Yeah? And then if you make them even smaller, you get a better approximation of the volume under the surface. And if you just kept it going and going and going, you would get eventually the actual volume under the surface. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah. So you can pass them around, look at them, feel them, really get a Riemann surface. Pretty neat, huh? So that's how they're defined. Um, usually when we talk about Riemann sums, it's just to put um, calculus on a firm foundation. It's like, this is how we're defining it. But now let's go back to taking the integral of x squared and just calling it x cubed over 3. Like, we don't usually use Riemann sums. But they are actually very useful. Because sometimes you don't have a function for the thing that you want to know. So for instance, So for instance, um, here uh, are topo lines for your granite quarry. OK, so granite quarries are something dear to my heart. I spend time in a place called Deer Isle, Maine, which is known for its pink granite. You're happy about this. I am happy about this. Why? Oh, you live in Stonington? Uh, no, we live in Cape Rocher. Oh. Well, not five minutes, but like 20 OK, yeah. So Deer Isle and Stonington are known for their granite. They have this pink granite. Have you ever seen a pink rock? It's pretty great. OK, so they have their pink granite. And so there are quarries all over Deer Isle and Stonington, which is a single island. Um, and so imagine that you buy a small piece of land. It's this square. It's maybe like one, it's, it's maybe like for the purposes of this it's uh, four meters by four meters. And you pay a surveyor to go out and tell you what, your, what the contours of your property look like. And here's what the surveyor says. OK, um, here's, this part is height one. This part is a level curve of height two. Here's a level curve of height three. Over here, uh, we've got um, another level curve of height three. And then here, a level curve of height 4. So it's kind of sloping up as you go that way. And here's 4. And here's 5. Nice. OK, so there's our uh, picture of what our piece of land looks like. And now you want to know, how much granite do I have? Like someone wants to pay me to uh, build something. Do I have enough granite to make it happen? So you want to know how much you have. OK, so we want to find the approximate value, find the approximate volume uh, using a Riemann sum. So, so the volume is the sum of, uh, let's see. So first of all, I'm a, I want just like a, a bare basic estimate. So I'm going to break this into two by two rectangles. Okay. 
And now it, within each rectangle, I'm going to choose a representative point. So maybe this point, uh, this point, uh, this point, and this point. OK, great. Th so those are my, like, my xi's. So like xi comma yi, my representative points. And I'm going to add up for each one um, f of xi times the area of the rectangle. OK, so this is approximate volume, is this sum. So let's do it. Maybe I'll start at the top and just go across like a typewriter. So the value of the function in the first one is 2. And the area of this rectangle containing it is 4. So I have approximately 8 cubic meters of granite in this first block. In the second one, uh, the value of the function is 3. And uh, the area of the rectangle is again 4. In this third one, the, let's see, the uh, value of the function is 5. And the area is again 4. And in the last one, the value of the function is 3. And the area is 4. So if I add these up, 2 plus 3 plus 5 plus 3 is 11. Is that right? 2 plus 3? No. 13. 13. Good. OK. 13 times 4, which is 52. OK. So I have approximately 52 total cubic meters of granite. OK. Good. That's good for the first round of investment investors. But now people want a more accurate estimate. How much do you really have? Come on, tell us more accurately. So now we have to go back through and break it into just one meter by one meter bits. OK, and now within each of these squares, we pick a representative point. So maybe we c there, I'll just pick one. It doesn't have to be on a level curve. You could pick another point and just estimate its height. Or you could pick one on a level curve. It doesn't matter. But now let's do it here. So our, uh, our better approximation is, again, the sum of f of each xi times the area of the rectangle. So let's see, going across, the first one is like 2 times 1, because this is on the level curve of height 2. So 2 times 1 plus the next one, this is 1 times 1 plus 2 times 1 plus 2 times 1. So this is the function value times the area of the rectangle. And now I'll stop writing the ones, because they're all area 1. But plus what? Uh, 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3. For the next row, 4 plus 4 plus 3 plus 3. And then for the last row, 5 plus 5 plus 3 plus 4. OK, so now I want to add all these numbers up. Anybody want to do it? Did anybody get 50? Yes, great. OK, so 50. 50 cubic meters. So our first estimate was there are 52 cubic meters, and our revised estimate was there are 50 cubic meters. You might have noticed that when I was doing this, I didn't have a lot of choices of where to put my points. So if I really wanted a better estimate, I might ask my surveyors to go back out and get me a better picture with more level curves. Like instead of just every meter, maybe every half meter or every tenth of a meter. So I'd have a better way to do this. Yeah. So this is actually a thing you would have to do. Because you can't find a function for your piece of land. Like Parish Beach out there, nice, long, sloping area. What's the function for it? I don't know. Well, you don't need a function for it, though. You can just have some data and figure out everything you need to know from that. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Questions or ideas? Yeah, so this is used a lot. Like, for instance, um, like interpolating from a, a bit of data that you have from the points. Like, you, did you see the movie Avatar? 
Yes? So um, any of them, um, if you saw how they made it, they had human actors, obviously, okay? And they stuck things to their faces and then um, filmed them and then took those, like the human, like, like stretched it out and made it into the avatar creatures. So you don't have a function for the way that someone's face is shaped, but you take a bit of data on what, where different parts of it is and then you extrapolate from that. So kind of the same idea. Okay. So one last thing to say is that the area under a curve is only defined if the limit that defines the Riemann sum exists. So this limit over here, so the area under this curve, f of x, dx, is defined as the limit of these Riemann sums. So if this limit doesn't exist, then this, this left side won't exist. So then we say that the function is not integ integrable on that interval. And when this happens is when the function takes on like an infinite value. So then you could make the area of that box any, as big as you wanted. And the same thing happens in multivariable calculus. So I'll just write that down. So um, a function is integrable over a region R if the limit used to define the Riemann sum exists. So as an example of one that does exist, the, the function that you're passing around, the limit of the function of the, the, the limit used to define the Riemann sum exists because the smaller you make those little rectangles, the more closely it approximates the function, everything is good. Um, here's an example where it goes wrong. So here's a non-integrable function. So suppose you take f of xy equals 1 over x squared plus y squared. So that looks kind of like a chimney. And horizontal cross sections are circles. So there it goes. And suppose we want to integrate this over some region r uh, that includes the origin, the point where weird things happen. So maybe you split it up into some rectangles. Good. And then over each rectangle, you pick an example point. Here's your example point. You find, you make the little skyscraper box over it. Everything's good, except for the point that includes the origin. So maybe that's, here's the origin. If you, over the rectangle that includes the origin, you can make this skyscraper box as tall as you want. You can make it have an arbitrarily high volume. Even if I make this a very tiny rectangle, I can still make the height as high as you want. So if I wanted the volume of this skyscraper little rectangle box to be a million, I could, even if I had the area to be like really small. So here, the limit would not exist over any region that includes the origin. So this is not integrable. Um, so the, the limit of the Riemann sum doesn't exist on any region including the origin. If I had wanted to integrate over some little piece over here, no problem. Yeah. So um, the theorem that says when things are integrable is just that the function is bounded and there isn't too much discontinuity. So theorem, which means the following is always true. Um, if f is bounded, and the set of points of discontinuity of f, so points where f is discontinuous, 
has area 0, f is integrable. Okay. So bounded, a function is bounded if its values don't go to plus or infinity or minus infinity. So sort of like you can take two planes, two horizontal planes, and fit the whole function between those planes. So here's an example of a function um, with discontinuities that we can talk about. So suppose you have something like here, like maybe this is a piece of cookie dough. It's like a, a flying piece of cookie dough. That's your surface. But now you take a cookie cutter and you rudely push it up through the surface. So you cut a hole in this. So here's the hole. And you take this bit of cookie dough and you put it up a little bit and you make it into a sort of a hat. So this is our function, both of these pieces. And let's suppose that uh, this, the, the f on these points on this circle are the parts up here. So this is defined over a region in the plane. So here's our region R. Um, and F is continuous everywhere except on this circle, the circle, the cookie cutter circle that you lifted up to make this cut. So for instance, F is continuous here because it's just this, this like a uh, curvy surface thing. F is continuous inside the circle because it's just this curvy hat thing. The only place that f is discontinuous is this circle. So if you were to break this thing up into your rectangles, here's my rectangles, and I start making my skyscraper boxes, I pick a value here, okay, it's about that high, I pick a value in here, okay, it's a little higher. The only thing where, where life is weird is along this circle. So it depends if you pick, for, for example, for this little rectangular part, if you pick an example point outside the circle, it's only going to be this high. Whereas if you pick it inside the circle, it's going to be this high. But as the rectangles get smaller and smaller, well, you're just going to have a lot of small rectangles along the outside and some sm tall rectangles on the inside, and there'll be a well-defined volume in there. So the idea is, that this place where f is discontinuous is just the circle. And a circle has no area. Though the disk, a disk has area, but the boundary, the circle itself, has no area. So the places where this function is weird, where it has this discontinuity, has zero area. So that has area zero, so we're good. And the function is bounded because the whole thing is between here and here. So the function is bounded, so this function is integrable. Questions or ideas? Okay, thanks. Enjoy the snow.